The Major's column marched forward, grim, determined, and mostly silent, even as the blue bullet-like shells of the enemy's artillery fell among them. He had more than enough men to storm the park where the enemy had set up their artillery firing positions. Which was good, damn good, because his tanks were the first things to vanish. Every Devastator his men had planned to use for cover. Every Lehman Rust tank that was to be their fire support and the very tip of the spear. Even the chimeras were going up in flames so fast men were choosing to hoof it over waiting for their turn to burn. The fire of the enemy was disgustingly accurate, with the only breaks in their attacks coming from those vanishing moments when the civilian buildings obstructed their firing arcs. The Major had tens of thousands of men, and he had been supported by a quarter as many tanks. But at some point in their long march toward the foe, they had become a target priority. One which only swelled, drawing more and more of the enemy's guns in the process. He had wanted to call for air support, either to hasten their approach or otherwise harass the firing positions. But apparently the troop carriers of the Republic doubled as assault ships, and they were not alone besides, aided by dedicated attack craft that could escape most of their deployed atmospheric fighters by veering into space. Suffice to say, the Navy had their own hands full. Even a tactical orbital bombardment was out of the question for the time being, with their larger ships engaged with their own form of trouble. He had wanted to wait for the shock drops and tactical squads of the Tempestus Scions to arrive, to wreak havoc with the foe's lines even as they advanced. But the word had come in, and the Scions had their own problems and objectives. They could not guarantee a drop in his battlefield. He had requested artillery firing support, but their basilisk turrets and other defensive emplacements had been badly mauled. Their vehicle depots raided, their remaining artillery capacity being used to hold the enemy's frontal assault on the Basilica. In dire fear and fury, he had demanded some kind of support even from the sisters, something to help his men cover the distance without eating death all the way. But what he received, and was made to be grateful for, was far less than he needed, and nowhere near what he wanted. Sanctus Command had promised them a vague but potent number of reinforcements, but made no commitment on their arrival. Besides, they had been ordered to defer to the command of the Sister Palatine, not him. From the sisters themselves, he had received something more substantial, though just barely. Annoyed, or perhaps impressed with his persistence, especially after his beating at the hands of their leader, the Sisters of Battle had bestowed him with two warriors of the Sisters Repentia, a penitent and her overseer. While he was glad to receive anything, neither of them would be able to shield his men or provide any kind of value until the battle was properly met. At least the penitent, large as it was, was capable of dodging and moving around the incoming volleys and had survived up till now. But now he had no tanks, almost no armored support at all. His column was messy, disorganized, running in places, marching in others, always under fire. He himself was marching with them, having abandoned his tank eight minutes before its destruction. Most of the other officers had followed suit, 
the ones who had not were dead. He flinched, heat scalding his skin. As several meters away, another shell impacted the road, scattering men and body parts in a red cascade which fell like grim rain over the marching soldiers around them. The Major's face and clothes were stained red enough that he could be mistaken for a commissar at a distance. The thought made him search around, and sure enough, she was still there, Commissar Indricta. She was marching through the gore rain roaring some kind of imperial anthem that the men around her were struggling to keep in tune with, their voices drowned out by the whistling and booming of the Republic's artillery. Though she was technically younger than him, she had all the authority to strip him of his unofficial rank and take command at any moment. In fact, while it shamed him to admit so, even to himself, that had been precisely the reason he had sought her out. But when he had found her, lounging outside the barracks, tall hat pulled over her eyes as if snoozing while the artillery fell all around her, she had not taken command. The young commissar had, instead, propped up the hat enough for the glint of her deep, violet eyes to complete the smug, cruel expression on her face, and said, Yes, I'm empowered to take command anywhere I see fit. She had then drawn her bolt pistol and lazily aimed it forward, her arm as thick as that of any male commissar. He had, at that time, stood to her left, the only thing before them having been the wreckage of a struck basilisk turret. Even so, the menace of the action had been even more frightening than the outrage of the sister palatine. But only after I execute the commander for incompetence. She said, then squeezing the trigger and firing a loud, cracking bolt into the wreckage. Or heresy, she added, firing again. Or cowardice, she finished, firing one last time. She had turned her expression on him then, an expression of bloodthirst so profound it would have made a hive tyrant envious of her genes. And with the focus of her eyes had come the barrel of her gun, now aimed squarely at his chest. Which one of these are you guilty of, exactly? And that had more or less settled it. He was in charge. The thought left him feeling numb and grim in equal measure as he waded through the rain of his men. And always, with each step he took, he was aware that it could be his last. That the last sensation he would have would be those of exhausted muscles, of being too hot, of being covered in blood and dressed in responsibility he had never asked for and had not been equipped to take. Such was the madness of the galaxy, the reality the Imperium sought to tame, he thought. The notion made him grin, something he regretted a moment later, spitting blood and growling, gritting his now red teeth. In truth, the fire falling among his forces was more showy than anything else, killing only five or six men per impact, nothing compared to the numbers he was bringing with him. And most of the enemy artillery was either focusing on the tanks further back on his line, those tanks in the other two columns he had created when he had been forced to choose an approach, or on the main battle happening much farther away. Even so, just one man being pulverized and thrown into the air could cause a shower, and this was more than that. Finally, relief. The shadow of one of the largest civilian buildings on their path passed over him and the front of his marching force, and they halted to recover and regroup their formations. Men wiped gore from their uniforms, shook soot from equipment, screamed into their hands and became sick, tossing up where they stood. Major Lazarus did not drop or rest, fearing that he would not be able to recover if he dropped any of his own fronts. While it was acceptable for his men to show their weakness, at least now, while they could, it was not acceptable for him, now more than ever. Instead, he waved his Vox crew forward and took one of their headsets for himself. Column Beta, Column Gamma, do you copy? Over, he said into it. This is Column Beta to Column Alpha. We are about to make the final approach over our bridge. Over, came the first response. This is Column Gamma to Column Alpha. We copy. We are also ready to make our charge on your command. 
The voice was cut off suddenly. Column Gamma? Column Gamma, repeat last transmission. Over. He said. No response. Column Beta, do you have visual on Column Gamma? Over. Again, nothing. But he could hear the Vox working. What had happened? Was he somehow being jammed? Had they been attacked? The more he thought about it, the more it made sense. The park could only be openly approached by three bridges. But luckily, just before each approach was a large commercial building, something the artillery was unable or unwilling to fire into, providing a place to gather in relative safety before the approach itself. If he were in command of the defense, this would be a prime spot for an ambush. But then why had the others been attacked and his group not? The others had arrived first, but if his location was also primed for a trap, why hadn't it been sprung? He looked around, and the reason hit him hard. His column was still gathering, regrouping. The enemy was going to hit hard with something massive, but what? Where? He looked around, eyes scanning the buildings, the road, the spires, the spires. There, adhered to the side of the spires, caterpillar-like tanks stood silent, unnoticed in their altitude and angles, only visible from here, and only when looking back the way they had come. His mind frenzied. What should he do? What could he do without creating a panic? Heavy weapons teams, set down! Arm! He called. Men turned to heed him, and sergeants and other officers repeated his orders, but no one had caught on yet, not any but the most canny who began looking around. Take cover! Into the megastructure! Prepare for an assault by the enemy! He called. Heavy weapons teams, aim there! He yelled, as the men who had just sat down paused in confusion, wondering if they should run for cover or stay on their weapons. They followed his aiming hand in a vague direction and quickly spotted their targets. They began to fire, LAS cannons, missile launchers, and more, beginning a stuttering first volley as the guardsmen began to dash for the huge structure which had been shielding them from the artillery. And then everything became hell. The tanks adhering to the side of the tall spires opened fire, and the doors and windows of the huge building the guard were fleeing towards flew open, revealing massed groups of clone soldiers who had been ready and waiting all along. Blast them! One of them roared, and the clones let loose a rain of scything blue death from their positions. The Major suddenly found himself caught in the crossfire that was surely consuming his other two columns even then. His men were faltering, they were floundering, they were dying! He grabbed the Voxcaster's howler mic and activated it, raising it to his lips and nearly deafening himself with the sound. Ah, men! To me! To me! He roared. His guardsmen did as instructed, beginning to gather. Affix bayonets! He ordered. Those who had not already did so now, locking the various wicked blades to the muzzles of their las guns and auto rifles. As one of the Imperator, charge! The Major screamed, pulling free his chainsword from the scabbard at his side and dropping the mic, charging first, but quickly followed by over 10,000 roaring human warriors. Together, they drove into the rain of blue bolts with desperation and fury born of the will to survive. Not as a race, not as an empire, but as men, individually and together, for just the next few moments. He was in the lead for a while, but then a shot took him in the left thigh, the center of his chest, and the side of his head. His carapace armor absorbed most of the first two shots, jerking and jostling him with high-speed, high-energy impacts. But he felt a fifth of his face slough off, and horrendous pain blossomed there. His speed faltered, and while he was not trampled, he was overtaken by the men around him, who, in turn, took the next volley of blaster fire, some of which had been destined for him, he was certain. But Major Lazarus did not cease his charge, did not surrender to the pain eating his vision and filling his mind. Instead, he channeled it into a scream of defiance and kept his legs pumping, even as a shot fired from a window far above cracked the carapace armor on his right shoulder. He drove on and on until suddenly he was there. 
His men had formed a ring of their dead around the window that was his target. The clones stationed there armed with rotating blaster cannons that spat blue death in wide volleys that only grew inescapably tight as he neared. The Major used his free hand to yank his first grenade off his belt, bringing it to the thumb of his sword hand to pull the pin before lobbing it and leaping forward behind the mound of the dead. The clones still fired, and their strafing shots caught his left leg and shin, blowing the carapace armor there away and burning him, but leaving him intact. The same could not be said for his enemies, as the frags sailed into the wide window they were using to fire from. The clones scrambled to escape it, but not only were they weighed down by their large guns, but Major Lazarus had not stopped his assault. Snagging and tossing more grenades from the corpses, clearing the window seconds later of anything they could still fight back. His men found him and pulled him to his feet, others charging ahead and into the window, the same thing happening all around them as the clones either withdrew or were overrun by one method or another. Cursing, spitting, and gratefully taking a shot of something which killed his pain, the Major followed his men into the building, still much more a sergeant than a commander. The place was some kind of market, a center of commerce with stalls and storefronts lining the walls of huge, open chambers of various shapes and designs, walkways always leading between them, matching the theme of the room. He moved through several, and soon found himself fighting inside a luminous white oval room large enough to fit two Imperial Knights, one on top of the other, its volume honeycombed with intersecting paths and bridges. The walkways in question were of an odd design, in his mind, made to look like railless, guardless paths of light. In reality, the paths did have guards, solid barriers that rose about waist-high on either side, invisible unless touched by something, revealing smooth white ceramic. He and his men, as well as their foes, used these for cover and found them oddly sturdy, though they became permanently visible in a wide radius wherever they were struck by either blasters, bullets, or last shots. The near-invisible nature of the paths, and the layers and layers of bridges above and below where he was fighting, led to a chaotic battlefield where Lazarus could only guess whether the shots he would take would actually fly to their target, or if they would suddenly be intercepted by yet another, previously unseen barrier. The room had been designed to look like a heavenly art gallery, but doing battle in it was like fighting in an emperor-damned funhouse. Suddenly, the two men at his side screamed as bolts from behind them struck them down. Lazarus leapt forward and tossed his smoke grenade, dropping to his hands and knees and crawling as they blind fired after him, making for a bend in the path, and thereby putting the waist-high barrier between himself and them. As the smoke cleared, he could see he had been outflanked. The damned toy soldiers had dropped down from a higher platform and had hit him and the men behind him with an ambush. They spotted him and fired, and he sneered as their shots hit the invisible barrier, and he vanished behind a suddenly revealed wall of pale but blackening ceramic. He popped up and started getting his own shots off, but he was just as hindered as they, and he felt like he had been chewed up by an ogren, his body a mess of aches and imprecision. They were moving up as they shot at him, trying to catch him dead to rights and out in the open. He grit his teeth slinging the last rifle he had been using and drawing his last pistol and his last grenade, a crack grenade. He pulled the pin on the thing and pitched it directly at the advancing troopers. The wounded major then watched the sphere adhere itself to the ceramic with some unseen technology, the gyroscopic shaped charge within spinning to face the surface before detonating. He would have preferred to use a frag for this, as crack grenades were made for armor penetration and did not have a great spread. Still, it did its job, blowing open a segment of the walkway barrier, killing one of the clones and exposing the others. He popped up again, firing with his pistol, the toy soldier so close as to keep its limited power effective. He had downed one with the grenade, and now two with his pistol, before the three that remained were on him, charging the rest of the distance. Ah, oh, feck! The Major groaned, shooting and stumbling as he took even more shots, his chest plate cracking and hissing, his left arm cooking, and his right leg losing its strength as a small hail of bolts chased him to the ground. He dropped his pistol and reached for the sword at his hip. 
tugging at it, but suddenly finding himself looking up at the three clones above him, one of them raising the butt of his rifle to begin bashing. The Major raised his arm to brace, but without warning, something dropped behind the clones, a shape in black, hitting the ground with a heavy thud. The clones spun, rifles out, and Lazarus craned his neck to see what had happened. It was a body, an Imperial soldier in black, having fallen from above. Thump, crack, and then another one fell, not too far from them, the soldier groaning, leg clearly broken. The clones turned back to the Major, intent on finishing him before more corpses fell on them, but the offending clone never got as far as striking. His bucket-like helmet, complete with the head inside, came flying right off his shoulders. The other clones reacted quickly, but not quickly enough. The long barrels of their cumbersome DC-15A blaster rifles making them too unwieldy to use in such close quarters. It was the first corpse, no corpse at all, the soldier having risen silently and attacked viciously. Lazarus' eyes bulged as he watched the guardsman, dressed in a black overcoat, his face hidden in a large, encompassing gas filtration mask, lunge. He lashed out at the second clone, swiping with his weapon, an axe of all things, and cutting one of the trooper's arms off at the elbow, following that up with a hard chop to the clone's skull, ending him. That was when Lazarus actually saw what weapon the soldier was using. No axe at all, but a... a shovel? The guardsman yanked his shovel out of the dead clone's skull and helmet, but would have been gunned down by the third clone had he not been gunned down first by the other guardsman, who was sitting up, ignoring his obviously broken leg as he riddled the white-clad clone warrior with bullets from his auto gun at close range. Two more soldiers dropped with hard thumps, though the enemy was gone, and the rest came down on more sensible repels as Lazarus was helped to his feet. He looked up and whistled at the height the others were coming from, looking at the soldier who had helped him up, and wondering how he himself was still standing after a fall like that. The Major was barely shocked to find Commissar Indricta leading these insane, faceless men. Coming down on her own rappel, her blood-streaked grin more alive than ever before. This was hell, and she was thoroughly enjoying it. Major Lazarus, I'm glad I found you, she said, disconnecting from her robe and walking over to him. I am elated to report the enemy is in full retreat. The fighting now is mostly in those pockets that we managed to corner and cut off. The structure is ours. Yes, ours, to be our grave. Forgive me for saying so, but this is no victory, Commissar. Our back is broken, our armor is gone, exposed and destroyed, and what is left of us is packed into this building. As soon as the enemy finish their withdrawal, I doubt they will leave it standing. They got what they wanted from this ambush. Our approach is... blunted, he said. But not halted, Indricta added. He thought for a moment, and then nodded. How many of these men do you have? He asked. She grinned more widely. Thousands, she said. And are they all as fearless as this one? He asked, clapping the soldier who had saved him on the shoulder. The man stood resolute as a statue and just as silent. She nodded. From where do they hail? He asked, still looking at the man, noticing how much shorter he was than he himself. He couldn't help but wonder how old the guardsman was under that mask. They come from a world called Krieg, she said. The word was like a clap of lightning, leaving Lazarus stunned. But slowly, he returned her grin and squeezed the guardsman's shoulder more tightly. Then perhaps our assault is not as blunted as I thought. Gather close, I have a plan.
Hey there all, this is a fan with too much time, and I'm um, just coming at you unscripted here at the end of the video um, to talk a little bit about a few things. Firstly, my uh, episode on how to improve lore is coming out. It's just taking a little longer than I thought. Um, Necrons will be the first one by popular demand, so I will be looking at the Necrons. Though, funny enough, and I'll tell you this ahead of time, um... Necrons have already had a pretty serious like movement in the lore, so it's kind of weird for me to examine for me to examine them. But I guess that just means that it's good to get them first and out of the way. Um, but that aside, uh, today's episode. I hope you liked it, by the way. Um, it was actually supposed to be part of episode um, twelve, and as you know, episode twelve is the longest episode I've ever made. So, needless to say, I ended up having to cut it because it it isn't really um, that integral. I mean, how do I say this? Everything is important and nothing is important, right? Um, in regards to the way this battle plays out, it isn't the most important thing, um, this battle that's going on here. And in part, that's because the Imperial Guard have just so many troops to spare. Um, but also in part because while it is important to neutralize this firing position, this firing position isn't going to be the thing that makes or breaks the battle coming up. And I hope that's not too much of a spoiler for you, but the Imperium is definitely focusing more on stopping, you know, the Jedi army um, and things like that. These are This artillery position is something that is important to take out, but it's not important relative to... Uh, the attack on the Basilica Gates and the actual Jedi army that is rushing up towards Sanctus Base. So, um, my point is just that at the end of the day, when I looked at the length of the script and I realized that I had to cut things, this was what had to go because as you can see, it's, it's rather a, a, a lengthy piece. I actually uh, hesita hesitate to call this a mini-episode um, because it's not too mini. Um, not compared to my original episodes, but I mean, hey, it is pretty mini compared to the episodes I've been releasing recently, so there's that. Um, that being said, I'm kind of glad that I got to go ahead and put this through. Um, got to see our uh, our boys from Krieg, our, our, our clones from 40k, and I'm pretty sure that's confirmed now that Vitae wombs are officially just a form of human cloning. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you know, how are Krieg here? Krieg are everywhere. Like, from what I understand, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but this is completely what I understand to be the case as of right now. Um, Krieg pays its entire Imperial Tithe with just people. Um, the planet itself can't really do anything else. It's so ruined that it's just these people production facilities in the form of the Vitae wombs that are of value to the Imperium. And it's funny because I don't even think the Imperium is really pushing Krieg or was pushing Krieg to be paying their tithe after their horrible civil war. But Krieg came up all hardcore and was like, nah, we're going to pay tithe and we're going to pay it all with people. And it's going to be people that are going to be d down to die doing anything. And thus a legend was born. Um, and of course, a Tyranid invasion. If you're a commander who thinks you're about to be facing down a major hive tendril, you get the offer for some Krieg reinforcements, you take that offer the moment your eyes see that piece of paperwork. Um, so, of course, that went down, and, and there are a few regiments of Krieg hanging around uh, for the sake of killing some Tyranids, uh, which they didn't get to do, but now they get to kill other things. So, you know, Krieg are happy as long as they get to be killing or get killed by something. Um, and, uh, yeah, this little uh, bit will actually end in another... Um, short-ish or mini-ish um, story in the future as you saw at the end there and will conclude what is going on with this firing position though while while I may make that a bit more integral now that I am going to ultimately include it um, I am pretty happy that I got to put it in somehow with this with this somewhat of a mini episode if you will um, but I'm not trying to make this mini episode too unmini, so I will go ahead and let you go right here, and I will keep working on episode 13 and 14, and hopefully I'll go ahead and finish those out while feeding you guys some more mini episodes, and when I am finally done with those, 
uh, like completely, then I can release them, and while they're getting released, I can sleep and do nice, like, luxury things such as uh, go to a movie and maybe hang out with my friends as long as they're all still alive. So, you know, that'll be a lot of fun. But in any case, until I see you guys next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay distracted if you can, because I know the times are hard, and I'll see you next time.